how would you, you help you with that design? How would you help with that design? You first, first, first. How would you help with that design? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, Dapper Dinosaur here. I'm coming with part two of Genesis Apologetic Should Apologize because they should apologize for this crap. But anyway, I'm going to pick up where we left off and as you can see, this one's not going to be fully animated because, well, that takes a really long time. That last video I did, about 16 minutes, took about 20 hours worth of work. So, I can't do it every single time, but I really love it when I can. And without further ado, take it away Genesis Apologetics. And in the biology book, there's a chart here that shows potassium-40 decaying into argon-40. Okay, I see. So based on how we can measure it today, we assume that every 1.3 billion years, the amount of potassium-40 decreases by half. This isn't just some assumption. Radiometric decay rates have been carefully measured and are governed by nuclear physics, which at its core is a subset of quantum physics. Quantum physics has proven accurate to a higher degree than any other theory in physics in terms of prediction versus measured results. For radiometric decay rates to vary would require the fundamental forces of the universe to vary, and if this happened, it would essentially be the end of the universe as we know it, as atomic nuclei would break apart and the universe would be bathed in a soup of helium plasma and antimatter. This is like saying that based on how we can measure gravity today, we assume that gravity in AD 33 was about the same and that rocks still fell at 9.8 meters in a second if let go 10 meters above the ground. If that were not the case, it would mean all of science is completely invalid, and it would also mean that we should be seeing some evidence of these radical changes in the past. We don't. Right, a radioactive half-life. So, when they discover a rock, they can measure the amount of parent material and the amount of daughter product, and using a chart like this, determine how old it is. Well, at a very basic level, yes, but as I've already gone over in the last video, there's more to it than that. So, what's wrong with this method? <laughs> well, the methods measure only the amounts of isotopes in the rock. This is good science because it is observable and repeatable. It just gives the ratio of one element to another. But the age is an interpretation of those measurements, not an observation. And that interpretation assumes answers to all kinds of untested questions. What if the rock already had a daughter isotope in it from the very beginning? Whoa! It's like scientists who spent their whole lives studying geology, chemistry, and nuclear physics never thought to question if maybe something obvious got skipped over. Except that, no, they are aware of the question of initial circumstances. Fortunately, there are ways to check on this assumption. One is isochron dating, which involves checking numerous isotopes of various elements to determine the age. And in the equations used, initial starting conditions cancel out, so it doesn't matter what they were once the analysis is finished. Further, there are many rocks in which daughter products cannot be part of the original material, because they would be chemically excluded. In the example of potassium argon dating, argon is excluding from forming crystals because it is a noble gas, and so is chemically inert. So any argon in the crystals making up the rock must have gotten there after the crystals formed. And since potassium does form such crystals, the only conclusion that doesn't involve magic is that the argon got there via decay of potassium. Or what if the rock gets contaminated? That's why you don't just test a single sample, you test lots of them. And when you do that and find a weird outlier, contamination is the likely reason. Or what if the rate of decay was rattled at some point in the past? Then physics would have had to be altered radically in the past to the point that matter could have well unraveled and the universe would be, to this day, bathed in harsh radiation. Oh yeah, and all of science would basically be invalid. What was the original ratio of parent to daughter isotope? I feel like you already asked that and that I already answered it. Are you eating apricot seeds like Kent Hovind? They'll rot your brain. One must assume no parent or daughter material was added or removed from the rock, and that the rate of decay has always been constant over millions and millions of years. Well, given that in most cases there isn't just uranium or potassium or lead or argon just laying around in piles all over the place, and that rocks aren't well known for sucking in material like a sponge, and that in many cases, daughter elements entering the rocks and becoming part of the crystal structure is physically impossible, and that varying the rate of decay is essentially impossible without breaking physics, these seem like they're decent assumptions. Are those assumptions wrong? I mean, if you start with false assumptions, you could get really bad dates. Well, many scientists think they are, and our textbooks don't even tell us about all the assumptions required to date the rock. Well, books for kids in school don't really have the space to tell you every underlying assumption to every principle. 
The fact is that these assumptions are so reasonable that they're barely worth mentioning. But the most convincing evidence is all the crazy dates they get with radioisotope methods. I wonder if our teacher even knows all the assumptions behind radiometric dating. To be fair, there are lots of dates that agree with one another. By lots of dates that agree with one another, he means the vast majority, when tests are done with proper controls. Radiometric dating methods overlap in range, and when we can test a rock with two or more methods, the dates almost always fall within each other's mutual range of certainty. The exceptions are when things like much older zircons are included in the rock being tested, so the test is essentially contaminated by older crystals that were included as intrusions when the rock in question was forming, or a later contamination from things like the person actually collecting the sample. But there are many examples of different mineral components of a rock giving very different radiometric dates, and very often different isotope systems give different ages for the same rock. Huh. Like I said, there are intrusions in the rocks. And since things like zircons are chemically distinct, if they aren't carefully excluded from samples being tested, then certain dating techniques will be off due to contamination. This isn't exactly some mystery to science. It's well known and can be controlled for. So how can you know which one is the right age, if any? By being careful with your samples and cross-confirming dates with other rocks from the same formation using multiple techniques. Basically, the same way you check any anomalous results, you use multiple data points. And then there are rocks we know the age of, where we watched it cool from lava that give radically older dates. Really? Yeah. A lava flow in a volcano of the North Island of New Zealand that happened in 1954 was dated to be 3.5 million years old. Wow, that's really off. I tried to look into the story, but the only places I can find anything about it are creationist sources, most of which go back to Andrew Stelling, a notoriously dishonest creationist geologist known for lying about sampling techniques, cherry-picking data, and generally being unethical as a scientist. So I trust his findings about as far as I can throw them which, given my short arms, isn't very far. But still, why might a volcanic rock give wrong dates? Well, there are these things called xenoliths, and despite what you might be thinking, I promise, xenoliths won't burst through your chest, causing your crewmates to scream in shock and horror. See, different kinds of rock melt at different temperatures, and to reset the radiometric clock, rocks have to melt. So what happens if the rock that melts to form the lava pool in a volcano is hot enough to melt most of the rocks in the area, but those rocks contain small bits of rock with much higher melting temperature. Well, when the volcano erupts and new igneous rocks form, they will continue to contain older rocks, like the zircons we've already talked about. Assuming that these creationist sources are honest, which is a shaky assumption in the first place, the most likely cause of the discrepancy is failure to exclude xenoliths from the tested sample, perhaps simply due to higher than normal amount of xenoliths in the rock in question. A volcanic bomb that blew out of Mount Stromboli in Italy in 1963 was dated at 2.4 million years old. And that dated much older than it really was. A 10-year-old rock from Mount St. Helens Lava Dome dated to 350,000 years and older. These instances have the same problem as the first one. They only seem to exist on creationist websites, and yes, it's possible to get anomalously old dates with samples if one is not careful or cherry-picks anomalous results while ignoring the more numerous typical results. But even if this disproved radiometric dating completely, it would just mean that we do not have reliable absolute dates for the Earth's geology, not that the Earth is young. You could just as easily say that the Earth is much older than we think, and it would do nothing to change our estimates for the age of the universe. So even if all this is a problem for radiometric dating, it's not a problem for evolution. If we can't trust radiometric dating on rocks that we can see formed, then how can we trust radiometric dating on rocks that we can see formed? rocks that supposedly formed a million years ago. I know, right? And there are so many other examples. Check this out. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's this? You carry rocks in your backpack while you're jogging? Hey, hardcore. Okay, this rock was taken from the Ono Formation near Redding, California, where millions of sea fossils have been found. This lower Cretaceous rock is supposed to be about 112 million years old. But the marine fossil stuck inside the mud rock, an ammonite, showed 36,000 radiocarbon years. <sighs> Sorry, I needed uh, some whiskey because of that one, because that was, that was stupid. But, uh, <clears throat> Here we go. 
Uh, you, you can't carbon date a permineralized fossil because all the organic carbon is gone. So this is all meaningless, and it can be easily explained by contamination, perhaps even by human collectors, but possibly even by modern bacteria, which tend to get into cracks and crevices and rocks. There's a reason carbon-14 dating isn't used on rock. It doesn't work. And that ammonite is rock. How can a rock be 112 million years old if it holds a fossil of only 36,000 years using a different method. It can't, and it doesn't. You're just too dumb to realize that you're using the wrong dating techniques. Techniques that couldn't even work in principle. I wonder if either date is meaningful. Seems kinda suspicious to me. The date that is based on actual science and not intentional fraud is the meaningful one. It's suspicious that creationists would misuse scientific techniques in an attempt to dishonestly discredit them. The evidence isn't seeming too rock solid. Hmm, funny. Let me see your diamond ring. You mean my purity ring? It's got a diamond on it, doesn't it? Sure, I mean, check it out. Aren't they brilliant? Hey, at the jewelry store, the science said diamonds take billions of years to form deep beneath the earth. I doubt that. Researchers find carbon-14 in diamonds. Why is that important? Radiocarbon decays quickly. It has a half-life of only about 5,730 years. So its maximum shelf life is only about 100,000 years before it becomes undetectable. And it might be impossible to contaminate an old diamond with young carbon. Well, no, contamination is pretty easy. Surface contamination is very easy and can simply occur from holding the diamonds. The other thing is that carbon-14 happens from capture of radiation by nuclei, something that can occur in the depths of the Earth, where 1. Diamonds form slowly, and 2. There is a lot of radioactive material occurring naturally. So in fact, we should expect a low level of C14 in diamonds, even if they did form slowly over millions or even billions of years. Wow, so those diamonds must be younger than they think! No, not necessarily. Especially since the diamonds were never alive, so carbon dating is actually an invalid technique to use on them in the first place. So here's the real question. Why are any of these examples in our textbook? because they do nothing to invalidate radiometric dating. <laughs> this scale is reading an extra 15 pounds on it. It just wasn't calibrated, okay? Hey, that's kind of like radiometric dating. Maybe everyone's been trusting that it's accurate, but it's been giving them false numbers. Yeah, especially when you misuse it, right? With all the overwhelming evidence that it doesn't work consistently, I'm surprised that they present it with such confidence in our textbooks. There is no particularly good evidence that radiometric dating is unreliable. It's known to be unreliable under certain well-known circumstances which are avoided when using radiometric dating. Jane, it goes back to the original quote we read in the book. If they're wrong about dating rocks, then the entire evolutionary theory crumbles to pieces. That's true. That's true. Except that it's not true. Not even a little bit. Evolution doesn't depend on the exact age of the Earth. It just depends on the Earth being old enough. And even without radiometric dating, we know it is. None of us were there to verify the assumptions. But God has provided a written account of history. And if you tally up all the chronologies and time cues in the Bible, the Earth is about 6,000 years old. So we trust God's word instead of man's fallible dating methods. It's like it says in Job 38.4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the Earth? Tell me if you have understanding. <laughs> it's like God saying, you weren't there. It should make you think. It should make you think about why it is that you insist on having an interpretation of the Bible that is at odds with virtually all of the physical evidence available. That's going to be it for this video. I'm going to continue to work on this really long video from Genesis Apologetics, but it might not be the next thing I do. I'm not sure yet. Thanks for watching. But before you go, I'd like to take a few moments to thank my patrons, especially my $20 patrons, Bob Knob and Res Instance. All of my patrons are helping me produce these videos by helping me get better equipment and software. If you'd like to help, head over to my Patreon. I have tiers starting as low as a dollar a month, and every bit helps. If a monthly donation isn't right for you, but you still want to help, please visit my merch store or my Amazon wish list. All links are in the description. Even if you can't help monetarily, your views and comments help more than you know. So please, if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you always know when there's new Dapper Dino content. Again, thanks for watching. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. <laughs> Well, interesting question, I don't know, I don't know.